Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hoop. And this is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, Play In With Sin. Some people take their eternity as a joke. They believe that eternity is some plaything that they can just fool around with, like playing Russian roulette just for the thrill of things. This is eternity that we're talking about. Even those who know better don't take it as seriously as they should, as seriously as eternity should be taken. Eternity lasts forever because they feel like sin is so cool. It's cool to them and so they play around with it. And with playing around with sin, they're actually playing around with their eternity. Turn with me please to Proverbs chapter six, verse 27 through 28. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? Well, the answer to both of these questions is a resounding no. No, you cannot carry fire next to your chest and your clothes not get burned. No, you cannot walk on hot coals and your feet not get scorched. If some, for some dark reason, somebody can do that, it's just not natural. The same is with sin. You cannot play around with sin and not get caught in its grasp, not get swept away in its sway. The very first murder that ever took place upon God's green earth started with a thought, a little spark of envy. In the book of Genesis, Cain's brother Abel offered a better sacrifice than he did. And God was pleased with Abel's sacrifice. But with Cain's, not so much so. So Cain became angry. He became envious. He became envious of Abel and God, their relationship. He became envious of Abel's offering. He became an, an envious man. And here is what God told Cain, though. Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. God said, if you do well. In other words, if you do what is right, if you do the correct thing, will you not be accepted? But you got to do what's right. You just can't do any old thing. You can't just offer any old sacrifice and expect God to accept that. You have to do well. That word translated do well actually means be good, be better. That is, be in a state of having proper characteristics or performing an experience expected function according to the dictionary of biblical languages with Semitic domains. In other words, God is saying we must always be in a way or always act in a way that is proper and have the characteristics of properness that to, to do what is expected of us. Paul puts it this way to the Corinthians in his letter, the first Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So whatever we do, it doesn't matter what it is we're doing, as long as we do it unto God. And if we're doing it unto God, we will not do sinful things. We will not do prideful things because we're doing this unto God it's as if this is an offering to God. It's a pure offering, a holy offering, an acceptable offering unto God. We do not flip-flop or waver between two opinions. It's just like Elijah told Israel, if the Lord is God, then serve Him. But you cannot be hot one day and be cold the next day. It just doesn't work that way. Some people play around with sin thinking that it's only a thing that it cannot reach out and take hold of them, that it's, it's kind of like this little monkey that we're gonna watch in this video. Turn your eyes to the screen.
He thought that it was all in fun and games. Maybe it was an adrenaline for him. His, his adrenaline got pumping and he, he, he thought it was very daring and he, he was excited over it. I don't know. But it was very dangerous. But he ought to, he even got on the ground and he ran around trying to entice those two, two um, tigers to chase him and try to catch him and he was just so daring. He was confident that he would escape before they could catch him. He would jump up a tree, he would climb up and get away from them. And that's how some people are. They're the same way. They play around with tarot cards. They play around with the Ouija boards. They play around with the horoscopes. They even play around with illicit sex. All the things of pleasure. But all these things are not from God. They're demonically motivated. They come from the dark side and they're very dangerous. You can get caught up in these things and before long you're swept away in, with uh, the, the dark arts. All of this stuff is from the evil one. You cannot play around with sin. You cannot pull its tail. You cannot tug on its ear and think that no harm can or will ever come to you. Remember, it's desire since desire is for you. But you must master it. Not by playing around with it or trying to be its friend. You can't befriend sin. You can't, you can't chase around and run around with it. You must cast it down. When you play with sin or with temptation, you become familiar with it. And its familiarity begins to break down your resistance to it. And eventually, you will give in to that temptation. You will give in to that sin. Because one thought will lead to another thought. And that thought still to another and then another. And before long, you're walking down that road. You're down and and you know what, what the scripture says? Sin's desire is for you. So once you walk down that road, sin will have its desire. And its desire is you. As the scripture suggests, you cannot carry fire next to your chest without being burned. Neither can you walk on hot coals and your feet not get scorched. Remember what God said in Genesis chapter 4 verse 7. Sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. The ESV says, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. That word crouching means be in a lion position, resting, but ready for action. So it's not in a hurry. Sin's not in a hurry. It knows that sooner or later, if you let it harbor around your door, you must come out. And when you do, it will have you. In his book, The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis wrote about a ghost who wanted to go to heaven. But he had a little red lizard on his shoulder and it kept him from entering. An angel wanted to kill it for him but he refused. Eventually, he did let the angel kill it, kill the lizard. The little lizard was representing the struggles that he had with sin, this ghost. 
He did not want to give up anything. He did not want to, to, to give up the little pleasure, that, the little lizard that was on his shoulder for heaven. He would rather lose it all and keep the little red lizard because he did not want to give it up. He thought it might be too painful. And that is how we are. We don't want to suffer any discomfort. And we don't want to deprive ourselves of any kind of pleasure. We want to pet our little pet sin. We want to speak kindly to it. And we want to ride on our shoulders. When God is saying, that can't come in here. It's like the monkey we just watched. That was a very daring game that that monkey was playing with those two tigers. If he was caught, if he had stumbled, if he had just tripped, he was a goner. Those two tigers would have had monkey for lunch. Everything has a price. Everything has a cost. Nothing is priceless. It all depends on what is offered and what is accepted. Jesus had to pay, pay a very high, high price for our salvation. It was not priceless. It had a price. And the price cost Jesus everything. It cost him his life. But he was willing to pay that price. It's like the song says, Sin will take you farther than you want to go. And it will keep you longer than you want to stay. Temptation is a peculiar thing. It doesn't tempt the untemptable. Meaning, it doesn't tempt that which is, is not susceptible to that temptation. It will try to persuade or it will try to entice you to do or say something immoral. It will tempt your, your, your sensuality. It will tempt you sensually, your, your pleasures. So temptation will convince you that that particular sin is okay with God. That in fact, it is God sanctioned when God is saying, no, that cannot come in here. Your eyes, your eyes will become blinded by self-pleasure and the danger will be minimal. That, Or you would think that the danger will become minimal, just like that little monkey thought that he could have a good time with those two tigers and nothing would happen to him. Some people call it living on the edge. But it is as Paul encouraged Timothy. He said, fight the good fight of faith. This spiritual walk is not a walk in the park. It's a walk through the valley of the shadow of death with evil lurking on every side and in every dark spot. And his desire is for you. His desire is to have you. But you must rule over it. You must conquer it. Therefore, we have to be spiritually awake and spiritually alert. This is a fight, not a cakewalk. We must pay attention to our surroundings and not let temptation wiggle its way in. And that's when not even one round. Here are three points to help you resist and overcome sin and overcome temptation. Number one. The first thing you must do is recognize your propensity or your weakness to a certain temptation. Whether it's sexual, whether it's anger, whether it's pride, whether it's lying, or any of the other sins. In the third book of, or the third chapter of the book of Genesis, God asked um, Adam and Eve a series of questions. He said, where are you? Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? What is this that you have done? He was getting Adam and Eve to admit and see where they were, see what they had done wrong. In other words, he wanted them to recognize their shortcomings or their sin. And he wanted them to confess it. Unconfessed sin is, a, is very detrimental to your soul. Some people are quick to see other people's faults, but they're not so discerning when it comes to their own flaws. 
Take an evaluation of your own words. Take an evaluation of your own actions and see how it lines up with God's word. You cannot help your fellow Christian with the speck in his or her eye when until you take the log out of your own eye. Number two, flee temptation. Once you recognize your weaknesses and shortcomings, then you must flee whenever you are confronted with them. Do not be like the monkey and flirt with temptation, but flee the other way. You cannot outsmart your enemy. He has been around for centuries. Do not think you are stronger than temptation or that you're smarter than your enemy or that, that you, you don't need to depend on anything or that you can depend on your own strength, but rather rely on God. He will provide a way out. Like 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 through 13 says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Number three, tear down every stronghold in your mind. Do not let fantasies build up in your mind. Do not dance around the edge of the abyss with death. Get rid of and stay away from anything that leads you into temptation. Throw it away. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 through 5 says, For the weapon of war are not carnal, but mighty through God to the tearing down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bring it into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Our weapons of warfare are not carnal. They're spiritual. They're spiritual through God, through Jesus, to tear down those thoughts. And do, do not let stronghold build up in our minds. Whenever some thought or some imagination arises in your mind, do not let it take root. Do not let it build up, but cast it down by taking control of it. Do not let it take control of you. Paul told the Romans in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be confirmed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Catherine Coleman, an American evangelist known for her healing services, knew what it meant to present her body as a living sacrifice and not to conform to the world or to the religious way of doing things. She was, she was one of the most famous well-known healing ministers in the world between 1940s and the 1970s. On one occasion, she was asked how many hours a day she prayed, and this was her reply. I want to quote, I pray all the time because if I limited the Holy Spirit to a certain number of hours a day, I would be in danger of using him for my own purpose. If for instance, I spent one hour a day in prayer. I would expect the Holy Spirit to reward me for that hour. I would begin to feel that it was that prayer or that hour in prayer that caused the anointing in the meeting. No, I cannot use the Holy Spirit in that way. I must practice His presence all the time. End quote. She did not act um, like God had a magical formula. She just wanted his presence. Here is what someone else spoke about Catherine Coleman. This is what they said, and I quote, It was not uncommon for Catherine to walk and pray and hold intermittent conversations all within a few minutes. 
I came to recognize that Catherine's life was one of 24-hour-a-day relationship with Jesus. She had no success formulas, no method or techniques. She just walked, talked, and lived as a powerful woman in the service of her God, end of quote. She, Catherine Coleman, wanted to see the glory of God. So what about you? Would you like to see the glory of God? If you would, this is how. All you got to do is to have a relationship with God. And that relationship starts with prayer, confession of your sins, asking for forgiveness. If you want to have a relationship, if you want to start a relationship with Jesus, pray this prayer with me. Father, forgive me of my sins. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and dying and purchasing my salvation. I accept the free gift of salvation now. Thank you. Help me to live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Do what's right. Always be prepared to resist sin, resist temptation by reading the scripture and committing it to memory. And when sin or temptation comes, you say, it is written just like Jesus did. Now here's what I want you to do. Find a Bible-believing church, one who believes in a right way to live and a wrong way to live, who teaches that the power of God still works today. Do not join one of those lukewarm churches or one of those progressive churches that embraces the things of the world, but a Bible-believing, God-fearing church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he will find you doing what it is that you should be doing. Always have a time of worship. Always have a time of prayer. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.